morning. Time to begin. I'd like to welcome everyone to the Oak Ridge Church of Christ. This morning we'll go over a list of our sick, Mary Rickstraw, Christy Tucker, Brenda Morgan, Buddy Robinson, Theo Weaver, Louise Coon, Larry Kennedy, Doug and Velveeta Roberts, Ricky Collier, Gene Hendricks, uh, Greg Gable. Uh, they said that uh, Greg is not doing very well. Greg is the son of Peggy, Peggy Bowen. Uh, he really needs uh, our prayers. He's not doing well at all. And uh, Grace Hendricks, she's at home. Uh, she's doing well, her and the baby, so she's keeping them up all night. But other than that, she's, she's, she's growing. <clears throat> On our COVID list this morning be uh, Jason and Tracy Hutchison. And on our bereaved list is the Kennedy family and the Ross family. Go over a list of uh, men to serve this morning. Kenny will be leading their singing at the. Uh, I'll have the opening prayer at the appropriate time. Brother Jimmy Dan will have our. Be in charge of the Lord's table, and we will use our closing prayer at the end for at the end of the Lord's supper. Our filming this morning be Chris Bozak. If you'd like to give your money, uh, like to say thank you to all of these. If you'd like to give money to the Ladies Fund, please give your money to Karen Lock. And that's all ways to remember our camp for camp drive. That's uh, all I have this morning. If you have anything, if you'll get it to me, I'll uh, I'll announce it later. Go ahead, we'll go ahead and do our opening prayer this morning. If you'd like to go ahead and bow with me, please. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we'd like to thank Thee for the day and all life's many wonderful blessings. Lord, we'd like to thank Thee for this time that You have given to us to come and to study Your Word. Lord, we ask that we would do everything here today that would be in accordance to Thy will. And we ask that you would be with John as he has a good remembrance of the things that he is prepared to say. Lord, we ask that you be with the members here that we would open our ears and we would listen and receive the message. And Lord, we just ask that we take everything and apply it to our everyday lives. I'd like to ask you to be with the ones that mentioned as being sick and bring them back to a better portion of health, be thy will. Lord, we ask you to be with the ones that have lost loved ones and comfort them as only you know how. I'd like to ask you to go with us through the rest of the service. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Our scripture reading this morning is going to be 1 Corinthians chapter 13. The first three verses, 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 3. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understanding all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith as to move mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all that I have, if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Jesus, because he first loved me. 
and I'm hoping I got her the right card because, uh, again, you were reaching over 20 other people, so I might have got one that was addressed to an uncle or something. I'm not sure, but I think everybody was happy with it. But but it got me thinking, um, you know, as I was preparing this lesson, knowing I was going to wait for the 13th, um, this concept of love. I mean, if I were to ask you, what is love, what would you tell me? I mean, it's a word we use all the time. It's a word that's in our vocabulary, isn't it? I, I love my spouse, and I love my kids, and I love my church family, and I love God, but I also love Italian food. And I also love catching all the green lights as I'm trying to go through town. I love that. I love a good book. I love a good shade tree in the summertime. I love it to be above 20 degrees outside. I love old cars. And on and on the list could go. But does this love mean the same thing in all of these instances? What does love mean? Someone was asked that question one time and said, well, that's love it is a feeling. What do you mean? Well, it's a feeling down deep inside. It's, it's like in your gut. It's a feeling. Brother, I, I've had that feeling after eating Taco Bell, so it's got to be more than a feeling, right? No, it's a feeling. It's a feeling you feel like you've never felt the feeling like that that you feel before. <clears throat> that don't make sense. You ever grab an electric fence? grab a whole electric fence, you'll feel a feeling like you've never felt a feeling like that that you feel it before, right? So that's not love. But what is love? Today I'm going to let the Bible work for that. For that answer for us. And we're going to focus on 1 Corinthians chapter 13 this morning, the love chapter of the Bible. I'm, I'm rendering it out of, the, out of the English standard because it uses the word love and that's what the King James is saying. But it says charity. and So I want it to make sense to me. So I'm going to render it out of the King James this morning. And, and I want us to first think about the importance of what love is. It, it's important. Paul talks about, and through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, about love being more important than some major spiritual things. Number one, he says in verse one, that love is more important than spiritual gifts. He says, Again, I'm going to read it again in verse 1. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but I have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. On the day of Pentecost, on that very uh, first occasion, that very first gospel sermon, when, when it was preached, God gave the apostles special gifts gifts to be able to speak in languages that they'd never learned and so that the people who were all gathered there could, could understand what was being said. But here in 1, Thessal, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul says that if God had given the gift to speak in every human language, more, moreover, if he gave the ability to speak in the voice of angels, but he didn't have love, then he'd be nothing more than a clanging symbol or, or a noisy gun. What did he mean by that? Well, back in the time of this writing, there was usually outside these pagan temples, these gongs or symbols hanging at the entrance of most of those things. And, and when people would come to worship, they had hit them. And, and we'll still kind of still got some in the, in the Eastern religions. They would come to this temple, they would hit these big gongs, they'd hit these big symbols to wake up these non-existent gods. So you see, love is more important than any spiritual gift. Paul goes on in verse 2 to say that love is more important than all knowledge. First part of verse 2 says this, And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and, and all knowledge, Paul says that even if you know it all, even if you have all knowledge here to know about the sciences and the medicines and the psychology and the sociology and every other kind of knowledge, if you knew all that but you didn't have love, then you said you didn't have nothing at all. Why? Well, Paul says in, a, in another 
part there, 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 1, basically this, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Now, don't get me wrong, knowledge is important, but Paul's point here is that we don't need more knowledge as much as we need more love. For the hearts of people need to change before society ever changes. Does that make sense? I, I mean, we've had so many great innovations in our time, but does it mean that society is better than it was? Oh, no. We, we've had all these developments over the last hundred years that have been what they say is advancements more than the last thousand years. But has it made our society better? Not spiritually, it hasn't. So that's Paul's point here. If a person, if a person has more love, that's what changes society more than knowledge. If a person's heart is not receptive, no amount of knowledge is going to change them. So it's important. How important is love? Thirdly, Paul says that love is more important. Now this is a hard to swallow. He says it's more important than faith. Now let's think about it before we get to work about it. Let's, let's, let's think about it for just a second. What he's saying, he's not saying that faith isn't important. Without faith, Hebrews 11, 6 says it's impossible to please God. So we know that faith is important. He's just saying that love is more important than faith. Let me tell you what I mean by that. Let's first read the verse. The last part of verse 2 says this. Now if I have how much faith? All faith. If I have all faith as to remove mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. What is your faith? What do you know in your heart this morning? Do you believe that God is the creator of the world? Do you believe that he gave his only begotten son, that, that he came into this world and he lived, he lived a sinless life to be that perfect sacrifice and, and he died and was buried and, and rose the third day? Do you believe that he's now the right hand of the Father? Do you believe that one day he'll come again in the clouds? If you believe all those things, well, that's wonderful. That's wonderful and I commend you for it. But the Bible teaches that if you believe all the right things, but you don't have love, then you're nothing. You see, without love, knowledge is just knowledge for knowledge's sake. Even faith is of no value if it's not backed up by love. Let me give you an illustration in the Bible, okay? Let's think back to the parable of the good, I mean, the story of the Good Samaritan, okay? It's a parable, but, but it's a story there that Jesus gives to give a good point. Well, what, who came by? First of all, there was a priest that came by. You don't think a priest has faith? Yeah, they have to have faith. That's part of who they are. Then they, and what did he do? He passed by on the other side. Why? Because that faith didn't have love behind it. Who's the next guy that come through? He was a Levite. You don't think the Levites had faith? Oh, yeah, they had to have faith. That was part of their job is to have faith. But what did he do? He passed by on the other side. He had faith, but he didn't have love. They just left that man dying there. In Galatians chapter 5 and verse 6, Paul says this, Only faith that counts is faith that expresses itself through love. Let me read the King James what it says specifically in Galatians 5 and verse 6. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision but faith which worketh by love. There's our word. So important, yeah. Love is very important. It's more important than spiritual gift. It's more important than knowledge. It's more important than faith. But here's a fourth one that, that, that Paul mentions here. Love is more important than generosity. Verse 3. If I give away all that I have, if I deliver my body to be burned, but I have not love, I gain nothing. Notice what he didn't say. He didn't say if I tithe. If I gave 10%. He said, if I empty my 
checking account today's late. If I cashed in my 401k, if I sold out my insurance policies, if I gave away everything for the help the poor, if I even allowed my own body to be sacrificed, I've gained nothing if I don't do it out of love. See, generosity is wonderful, but by itself, it's not enough. I get calls uh, pretty regularly, and I, I'm sure that you do too, from people who are appealing for money. They're wanting funds. Sometimes they're trying to get it in a crafty way. I've got this guy calling me, and he, he says that he's from the federal government. He has a warrant for my arrest. That's the last <laughs> message that I had last week. But he doesn't talk like somebody from the IRS that I've ever talked to before. See, why do you give? Why do you give? Do you give just because you've heard a, a lesson and it moves you on stewardship? Do you give because you feel guilty if you don't? Do you give because you want to impress other people around you? So many reasons for us to give. Uh, when you're talking about the IRS here in a couple of months, we just got our W-2s and we're going to have to do this thing for the IRS. And sometimes we have to give to the IRS. Now, I'm going to tell you, I don't love giving to the IRS, to the government. But I have to. You see, you can give without love. But you can't love without giving. If the only reason that I give is to give or to receive something for myself, to benefit myself, then love isn't there. And Paul says it's empty. We gain nothing. The motive for giving should be love. Love for God. Love for God's people. So Paul's saying here that, that love is this important. It's more important than those gifts. It's more important than knowledge. It's more important than faith. It's more important than generosity. But let's go a little step further. We know, we see that it's important, but let's practice it. Let's talk about that. Love is very important, much more maybe than we've ever realized it before. But listen to what Jesus says in John 13 and verse 34. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. Now notice that Jesus says that this is what? A commandment. I give them to you. It's not a good idea. It's not just a good idea. It's not just a suggestion. It's a commandment that you love one another. And God never commands us to do anything that we cannot do. What does that matter? Well, we think that sometimes the world's view that we take that on love is that love is just something that happens. And that's that's what we're taught, right? You fall in love, it's like you fall in a ditch. You fall out of love, it's like you fall out of a tree. You can't help it. It's something that just happens. I'm just falling in love. I'm just falling out of love. No, that's not what it happens. God's never going to command us to do something that we cannot do. You remember this old song? Elvis used to sing it. I can't help falling in love with you, right? What about this one? You've lost that loving feeling. That's some really deep stuff, you know. But the Bible teaches us that love is something we can control. God commands us to love each other. That means I can decide to love you. And you can decide to love me. And that's not a feeling type of situation at all. That's not a feeling to feel that you feel when you never felt a feeling that like you're feeling before. That's more than that. That's not that situation at all. What kind of love is being talked about here? Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 4. Philippians chapter 2, Paul also is telling us this. Look not every man his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, as also was in Jesus Christ, who, 
being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. In other words, we love in the same way that Jesus loved. Not because we deserved it. Not because that it was something that we were owed, but God loved us. Jesus loved us and gave his life. Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. Folks, here's the bottom line here. Love is action. Love is action. Think about others. Think about their interests, just like you think about yourself. Just like you think about your interests. You have to become unselfish. Now, with our remaining time together this morning, let's make some applications to that, okay? Now, I'm going to meddle for just a second, but it's because I love you, all right? Let's think about this. First of all, I can see how this practical thing about love can make a difference and work in my family. This thinking about others and their interests more than I think about myself and my interests, okay? Let's start with our own family. Let's suppose that someone in this family here, someone who's in the audience today, someone who's listening virtual, seeing virtual in the, in the audience today, says, I'm going to go home, and I'm going to put this into practice. Start local. Start with your home. Start with your spouse. You ought to love your new husband or your wife more than yourself. Isn't that what he says to do? To, to give your life, to be willing to give your life for them, just as Christ also gave the, uh, love the church and gave his life for the church. We need to be putting their interests before our own. We ought to be kinder. We ought to be more thoughtful, not just on February the 14th, not just on the 13th when we break Walmart and get those flowers, those candies, the watermelon, the flowers, and balloons and things. But every day, be more gentle. Even if they're behaving like someone that you don't need to be tender to, right? You know, because it's easy to love someone who's, who's always going to just love you back, but sometimes, quite frankly, we as husbands can be jerks, okay? I'll go ahead and say it. But you be loving. You be more tender. You be more gentle. Even when they're not as lovable as you'd like for them to be. And you see what this does is it filters down to the relationships you share with your children and everybody else in the family just because you love them. Now, it doesn't stop that. It begins with the family. It spills over into the church family. And in fact, in John 13, verse 35, and then go ahead and say, by this will all men know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. That's how the world sees it. You see how it trickles down? It starts in your own houses. It starts in your own houses. It bleeds out into your spiritual house. It bleeds out into your church family. And then from there, the world sees it. Jesus says the world sees it. That you love one another. And that's how it gets out into the world. That they see a message of Jesus. And that that message is a valid message. And if we really loved each other the way that Jesus loves us then we have to develop our own lives with that same kind of compassion for people that Jesus had. There's a more excellent way. And that way is Jesus Christ. This morning, if you've not, if you haven't had this opportunity, if you've not taken this opportunity to make Jesus the way, you know how you make Jesus the way? Well, by grace through faith. Not that we're going to earn our way, but by grace through faith. What do you mean by grace through faith? I mean by obedient faith. Believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Being willing to change the direction sometimes in our lives where it doesn't coincide with God's way. 
That's repentance, right? How about confessing his name before men? It's John 10, 9 and 10. How about confessing his name before men? And, and Jesus says, he will I confess before my Father who's in heaven. And you know, that's not a one-time thing. You ever realize that? That confession goes on every day as we walk out amongst the world. Do you, are you making that confession that Jesus is God's Son? Are you willing to be baptized to put on Christ? Galatians 3, 26 and 27, Romans chapter 6, 1 Peter 3, verse 21. And on and on we can go there and see where this is an example after example after example. And to be able to be in contact with the blood of Christ. That first gospel sermon that we talked about when those spiritual gifts were first poured out. When they said in, in Acts chapter 2 and verse 37, what shall we do? Verse 38, Peter said, repent and be baptized for the remission of if you haven't done that this morning, we, we're going to offer this invitation. There may be those this morning who need to, 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 to lay those burdens down. That invitation song, burdens are lifted at Calvary. Maybe you've not been as loving as you need to be. And you want to change that course and change that direction. I promise you, it'll make a difference in your life. Paul says it's that important. By, by, by sin, by turning our back on God, by doing things that the world would have us do instead of doing things that, that God would have us do, we're, we're not being faithful as a bride of Christ. And we need to make changes. And this invitation is for you. If you need prayers for, the, for forgiveness of sin, if you need prayers for strength, let's help you with that. You pray for us and we're going to pray for you. If you need to respond to the gospel song, won't we you come as we stand together and as we sing?
Just prepare for the Lord, so. Let us pray. Oh, hello, Father, we come to this part of the service that we honor thee through thy word and through thy blessing. We want to thank thee for the bread <clears throat> that so fitly represents the body of your Son and our Savior while hanging on Calvary's tree. May tell us to take it in remembrance of thee in Jesus' name. Let's have a thank for the cook. Our Heavenly Father, thank thee for the bread. We also want to thank thee for the cook, the fruit of the vine. That so fitly represents the blood that was shed from your Son's side and our Savior. We ask thee to make each other do it, ever looking back to thee. In Jesus' name. This concludes the Lord's Supper. Let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for all the blessings of life that you have blessed us with. We thank thee, Heavenly Father, for giving us, giving us a strength to earn a living for our families. We ask thee now, Heavenly Father, that each of us give back to thee the portion that thou hast blessed us with. We let us do this all in your Son and our Savior's name. In Jesus' name we pray.